much for coming. I'm Michael Green from Green's List and we do welcome you and thank you for coming. As you are aware, this morning we have uh, two speakers that um, cover the areas. I think you probably some discretion here as to whether you choose to put them under ethics and professional responsibility or practice management. I think they cover um, both areas. Our first speaker this morning is Michael McGarvey. I think we're very fortunate and grateful. Michael is the Legal Services Commissioner, as you would know, um, that Michael's taken the time to come here this morning and speak to us. Michael's been in the law, I guess, all of his working life would be the easy way to say it. He has been the Legal Services Commissioner since t December 2009. Prior to that, he was the CEO of the Supreme Court for three years. And then prior to that for, um, I think, 23 years on my maths. It says here Michael practices as a solicitor in a private firm, but I think I tell no secrets if I say Michael was a partner at Holding Redlick for most of that time. Therefore, Michael has got um, extensive experience in the practice of the law and from varying perspectives, um, from the perspective, I guess, of the judiciary and uh, the bar, maybe, in his time at the Supreme Court, as a daily practising solicitor for a long period and now as the Legal Services Commissioner. So, as I say, we are extremely fortunate to have Michael here this morning to address us on ethics and professional responsibility. Michael, thanks very much. Thank you, Michael, very much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, the PowerPoint slides are really just my speaking notes. You're welcome to have them. You'll, you'll get them. But um, I have asked uh, Jenny Jennifer Pakula, one of my managers of investigations, to allow me to distribute her paper, which is a, a much uh, better technically written document than I do, um, which uh, provides more information about the approach we take to complaints and the use of ADR techniques. Now, uh, the, the important point that Michael made was that I was a, a solicitor and, uh, and partner, a solicitor for 23 years, and of those 23, a partner for, for 18, because I don't believe you can regulate um, a profession without being absorbed within it and understanding um, its nuances. I find myself in uh, um, a much more confident position, having been a solicitor myself on the receiving end of complaints myself, dealing with the thrust and, and cut, cut and thrust of uh, your relationship with clients for a long time, and the issues that arise in connection with providing excellent legal services. Um, only yesterday morning, the issue was brought to my attention by an interview with Graham Samuels on Radio National. He said it was essential for ASIC to earn the trust and respect of government to effectively apply its skills and intellect to corporate regulation. And he's right. Good, good regulation is about good relationships and they do require trust and, and, and respect uh, from both lawyers and consumers. But the important lesson for me and my staff is that we have, we have to earn that from the lawyers and consumers. The Legal Profession Act doesn't just deliver that respect and trust on a platter as though um, we uh, are, are passive uh, act, act, actors in the scene. Um, and I've registered a, a, an improved regulatory environment by working very hard on our relationship with lawyers. Just a little bit about the two regulators. They're one, from your point of view, but there are two. One's the board and one's the commissioner. I happen to be CEO of the board and the commissioner because that's what the Act says you have to be. But the, the board does all aspects of regulation other than complaints and uh, therefore it has a registry, registers the 16,000 practitioners in Victoria. It uh, deals with uh, trust accounts and we share that, we co-regulate that or delegate that to the LIV and the bar. It manages a fidelity fund which is your compensation fund that pays consumers for, uh, for um, or pays them compensation uh, um, for monetary loss as a result of fraud or dishonesty by a practitioner. 
Um, it invests funds. Uh, it, it, it invests funds to support the public purpose fund, which, as as you know, is is is, is your client's money. The interest earned from trust accounts it goes to the public purpose fund and and goes to to pay for legal regulation. Receiverships puts practices in re, in receivership if they're not performing. Uh, issues and takes away certificates every year, um, assesses um, the suitability of a person, the fitness and, and propriety test. And again, those three functions, receivership, certificates and suitability, are shared between us and the LIV and the bar in a delegated process. We issue foreign licences to people who need to practise their foreign law in Victoria. Often they're teaming up in a group in a large law firm, Hong Kong law, American law, Victorian law, providing a job lot service, they need a licence here to practice. Uh, CPD, supervising continuing professional development, we share that role with the LIV and the bar, and a special role of supervising incorporated legal practices, which are a, a different creature. But the other half of the regulator is the commissioner, and the commissioner's role is to investigate complaints against lawyers. We get 2,000 complaints a year, you may think that's a lot, but the, the telecommunications ombudsman gets 2,000 a day. Uh, but our 2,000 a year are eight a day. Um, largely, they relate to family law, probate and estates, property, small commercial work and personal injuries work. Not because those practitioners are any worse or more, um, um, more, more inclined to um, <laughs> conduct themselves differently, but because those areas of law involve emotion, involve often one-off cases or pieces of work, uh, involve um, the p p potential for there to be a breakdown in the relationship between a lawyer and her or his client. And it's that lesson that was such an important lesson for us as a regulator. We might get eight complaints a day, but seven of them have got nothing to do with fraud or dishonesty, or conflict of interest, or theft, or criminality. Seven of those eight complaints a day are about relationship breakdown. Swore at me, slammed the phone, working too slow, charged me too much against what I was promised. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to be acting for my interest because they spoke to my brother-in-law. All the sorts of things that involve a, 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 um, an erosion of the trust between a lawyer and a, and a client. And until we, as a regulator, learned the difference and the need to triage the types of complaints coming through our operation, we were making a mistake. We were turning every one of those eight complaints a day into a Royal Commission. Most of them were potentially soluble. And the issue for us was to realise that the, although the Act creates a, an elegant system of mediating costs complaints, and in fact our role is to mediate them, uh, and if we can't find a, a solution between the lawyer and the client, then the lawyer and the client um, need to take the matter to VCAT to, uh, to, to seek a ruling. But the Act never created an ADR process or a resolution process for conduct complaints. Because I suppose theoretically, if it's misconduct, how can you resolve that? You're either guilty or not guilty. Yet it's, an, it's not until you realise that seven of those eight complaints a day are not best managed by a, a finding a, a ruling or a determination of guilt or, or not, not guilt. Most of them are soluble by, by a means of um, talking and uh, and negotiating. And accordingly, we've created this, this whole section, ADR section, that attempts to resolve conduct complaints via a single section that simply says the Commissioner can determine whether and to what extent a complaint is to be investigated. And that's the only clue I've got in the legislation to allow me to create this new and I think very workable structure around the, the rapid resolution technique of dealing with complaints. Um, old fashioned systems of picking up the phone, we try not to send a lawyer an officious letter saying you've been complained about, there are five elements to arms to the complaint, uh, explain your conduct within 16 days, put it in writing, 
no further correspondence will be entered into. We try not to do that anymore. We approach conduct complaints differently. We have senior people, in fact three of them um, are on the edge of retirement and I've been lucky enough to secure them. One's Del Bobe from a, a, a large law firm throughout his life, city law firm. Uh, Lou Pakula, who is from uh, the, uh, was a company lawyer, but, uh, but also from, uh, uh, ran a suburban practice for most of his life. And Kevin Power, who was once upon a time head of professional standards at the Law Institute and spent five years for work cover conciliation. I've been lucky enough to get those three people and others. There's, a, uh, there's a, a, an ex-barrister, Penny uh, Antonov, now Penny Fricky, who he is, um, or has also been involved in this area, and Shelley Lippi, who has uh, 25 years' experience in legal regulation from ASIC and other places, law firms, has been a partner of law firms. So these senior people are usually now the first people to deal with a complaint. And they'll pick up, they're expected to pick up the phone and communicate with a complainant, understand the nuance of the complaint. Because when a complainant, a, a, a consumer says, they charged me too much and anyway they took too long to bring the case to a head. A, a, a short-sighted regulator might say, well, there's two components to that complaint. One's a cost complaint and one is a conduct complaint because they took too long. Theoretically, you're not allowed to take too long. But a, a thoughtful regulator has got to accept that that last limb of the complaint is connected with fee. This is a, a blue about a fee. And until we realised that we had to manage and triage and understand the subtlety of some of these complaints and work with the complainant managing their expectations, like every good solicitor does and barrister with their client, manage your client's expectations. Until we started managing people's expectations, we were getting it wrong both ways. We were irritating lawyers for investigating too hard and too long in trivial cases. And we were irritating consumers by not managing their expectations about what we were able to achieve. Maybe investigate an issue, you know, a phone slam and an overcharging issue for nine months and decide not to take it any further and completely irritate the complainant for taking so long. So we now pick up the phone, we call, we then speak to the practitioner and, and introduce them in a mature but tactful way to the fact of life for all of us. Um, we will make mistakes. We, we, without even making mistakes, we will attract complaints. And they're manageable uh, uh, and they're very, very different from theft, fraud, dishonesty, conflict of interest and all the big ones. So as a regulator, we, we are much more sensitive to the the issues relating to regulation. Some of you would have read the Fin Review last August headline, the saddest profession of them all, that's us. Because one in five of us in our professional life will suffer from anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression is per a perfectly manageable Ill uh, condition that uh, uh, ha ha does not necessarily have any relationship to your conduct or your suitability or your fitness um, but unmanaged causes frightful problems especially with um, your relationship with your client. In fact we often try and connect um, aspects of a, a, a person's uh, dissolving legal practice or their dissolving um, personal affairs to complaints because it's very relevant to the way we try and handle the whole picture. And until we understand that one in five people who are complained about may well be um, affected by anxiety and depression that's unmanaged, um, then we won't, we won't deal with the whole issue. Uh, and it's, it's, it's our job not, to, not just to res respond to the immediate complaint, but to assist in preserving this profession's, not ours, your very high standards in connection with professional service. So sensitive to depression, we encourage people to phone a friend and, and uh, anyone, another partner, a colleague, the LPLC. In fact, uh, Richard Antill um, um, and his colleagues um, have been encouraged by us to um, uh, operate as a sort of a port of call. They, um, they deal with negligence actions, we deal with complaints. 
but as I'll run through in a second, often they merge together and we're, we're, we're working on issues um, together. Uh, the LIV have got, have got people who are trusted confidential advisors who can talk through an, an issue, a partner, a colleague. We encourage people to come with another um, spokesperson and not to feel as if they're um, behaving in a hostile way, dealing with us through others. Because meeting and talking is such an important ingredient to getting regulation right. We're also now confident enough to try and give a practitioner early, early information about where we're headed. It's really important for regulation, especially if we're getting eight, eight complaints a day, that we signal to a practitioner that we're not after their licence that only one in eight ha have conduct elements to the complaint that are serious. That uh, if we're going to negotiate in a healthy way, attempting to s resolve the differences between a practitioner and a client, the, cl the practitioner's got to know it's safe to negotiate. That there is a, an end point, there's an, a man uh, there is a manageable process without a... Um, a, 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 um, an untamed and um, a ferocious regulator doing tricky things. Um, but we've got to get that impression to practitioners ourselves, using ADR techniques, looking for mutual resolution, resolution quickly where there's no major misconduct, remain accessible, and that includes pretty straightforward communication tools like texting and, and, and emailing. Um, you might be amused, but it um, wasn't so long ago that we didn't use email to communicate with the outside world. Our operation, and I'm not sure you can manage your relationship with anyone without using email these days. And the, the other thing that's not on this page, but it's important for our people to remain sensitive to the distracting and, and harmful, the depressing effect of being on the receiving end of a complaint and then the receiving end of an investigation. We've got to remain sensitive to that. One of our, my uh, expectations around staff commencing an investigation is to find an opportunity to try and get to the practitioner's workplace, um, to pay a house call. I had one example where one of my staff said, I'm dealing with a, a crook out in Whoop, whoop. He's, uh, he's very unsavoury and very un, un, untrustworthy. I said, have you, have you visited? No. She visited. She came back and she said I was completely wrong. He was so disorganised it was, it was tragic, but he was honest as the day is blue. He gave me every answer I needed, provided me with all the documents I asked for, but you should have seen the conditions he was working in. You know, working off the top of a photocopier, someone had taken the facts that didn't work anymore shocking conditions and we as a regulator have got to remind ourselves every day that performing at a high level as a, a, as a, prof a professional um, is sometimes extremely hard in, in, um, in, in, in abject circumstances. And as you know, not all of us work in lucky firms like my old firm, Holding Redlick, where You've got the facilities, you've got the cash flow, you've got the clients, and you've got the partners around you. Uh, so the work that we've done has changed the climate relating to our, um, our um, statistics since 2009. We had 2,000 unresolved complaints in our books in 2009. We got them down to 1,500 last year. And this June, 30th of June, we've got them down to 850. Now that may not mean a, much to you, but it's very important to us because it means that the case per investigator has dropped by half, 107 files each to 50 odd files each. That we're able to close cases much faster than we were before by trying to tackle alternative ways of dealing with new cases and alternative ways of in, 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 investigating and handling old cases. And the, uh, of course, if you're getting 2,000 complaints a year, um, you've got to be watchful that you're not holding on to 2,000 complaints a year. You've got to have that, that clearance rate to make sure that you're um, producing a fair flow and 
opening and closing cases quickly. Just run through a couple of examples. These are not earth-shattering High Court cases. They're not even cases that have gone to court. They're just examples of cases that we've got in the office or had in the office recently that are relevant to both the negligence actions and legal regulation conduct complaints. So the first case is a valuer um, who was supposed to be involved in a family law property case. The allegation was that the solicitor was negligent because because he or she used the wrong valuer in a property evaluation case. And there was a complaint about poor capital gains advice. And so the complaint was with us and the complaint was with L LPLC, or the issue was with LPLC. Um, the, the, the concern was that the error had produced unnecessary extra costs. In the situation we had, the solicitor readily agreed to reduce the fees to, to respond to the concern, and the complaint was withdrawn. Now, you might say, well, withdrawing complaints, is that such a good deal for consumers when, uh, a, if a complaint's you know, significant enough, it should be in investigated and completed? Um, well, w we see it very important to, um, to uh, accept that withdrawal of a complaint is a, 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 an authentic and sensible way of dealing with case handling. Um, on condition, of course, that the needs and the concerns of the consumer are adequately met. Uh, we're not in the business of persuading people to withdraw complaints just to, to, to bury cases, but where we produce what we regard and the consumer and the lawyer accepts are uh, um, reasonable compromises, then we are very comfortable seeing cases of complaints withdrawn. Um, another one is a lease of IT equipment. A solicitor was hired for a dispute over a computer lease. Um, the goods were not fit for the purpose. Um, the shop agreed to take, in fact, it's not a shop, it's probably a huge retailer, actually, uh, agreed to take the, um, oh, probably a wholesaler, take the, um, the IT equipment back, but the solicitor was too slow to respond and um, a, 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 um, no return um, was agreed upon nor enforceable when the solicitor got round to returning the, the goods as instructed and that caused a loss of money to the client. Now the solicitor was sued in negligence um, and coordinating with the LPLC um, we had um, the, um, the, the situation that involved the LPLC meeting compensation uh, in the claim and, and the solicitor acknowledging the mistake. And in that, in that situation, we formed the view that the complaint was worthy of being dismissed, given the outcome that was achieved for the complainant, and given the modest nature of the error committed by the, by the solicitor. A third example is um, a family law child abduction case involving the solicitor failing to lift an old departure ban orders. So by this stage, husband and wife had made up. There was no threat that the kids were going to be taken to um, an overseas location. Um, years later, uh, she booked herself into a cruise and turns up um, ready to take the children and uh, is prevented from leaving the country and uh, was suffered non-refundable costs of paying for this cruise. Uh, turned to the lawyer and said, well, you were instructed years ago to lift the, the uh, child abduction banning orders. And again, the LPLC was involved. Uh, we, were inv we were alongside when the negotiations occurred. Um, the case settled for $2,000, which represented a fair sum to compensate the losses of the complainant. And part of that LPLC agreement involved the withdrawing of the, of the, um, the complaint against the solicitor. Uh, so they're sort of humdrum cases that sort of come and go. Um, there are other cases where we get involved in frightful situations, one occurring right now, involving a, um, a power of attorney, a lawyer who's a power of attorney mishandling money. The client's in the nursing home, the solicitor forges the power of attorney, 
The solicitor buys two properties and five cars, gives two of the cars to staff, um, withdraws cash. Uh, police have just arrived this week. Um, Three hundred thousand dollars in cash in the garage. Why is it there? Well, it's the nursing home person's uh, money, but I'm protecting it from another global financial crisis. Uh, police involved. Eight hundred thousand misappropriated. Shocking, urgent. All, the, all my resources are, are running ragged this week. This occurred last week, first information last week. Uh, today, external intervention is taking place. And so we have some humdrum issues and we have some urgent crisis issues with, with money running down the drain and, and clients' affairs um, being, being trashed. Court case examples, very quickly, um, they're all in on Ostley. Um, I'll just give you a flavour of the sort of the variety of cases. You know about Mr Brott and uh, um, I can't walk down William Street or Collins Street without somebody finally thanking me for <laughs> removing Mr Brott from our honourable profession. <coughs> Falsified instructions. Uh, lost his licence and then we took it to the Supreme Court and had him removed from the role. But uh, it doesn't just... Uh, major misconduct problems don't just arise relating to your activities as a lawyer. Uh, the Keogh case involves plagiarism, published in a medical journal uh, for a master's thesis of some sort. The master's thesis got through and was marked and was probably well marked. Um, the practitioner was very happy with the paper and delivered it to the law of uh, the, the Journal of Law and Medicine. Uh, the uh, very nifty uh, editor did a classic plagiarism check through um, a program, um, found over 40% of the article written by two German people, uh, word for word, and he lost his licence as a result of being caught um, committing plagiarism. Uh, Moore is another one, that's a tax case, not directly connected with uh, legal services, but um, major tax fraud, didn't pay for over 10 years, hundreds of thousands of dollars involved, um, and following the conviction, uh, I took action and had his... Um, had, had him uh, prosecuted for, or I prosecuted him for misconduct. And uh, again, that involved a, a penalty to, to Mr Moore. And the final one is Frugenet, which isn't a, a person who pretends to be a lawyer, his unqualified practice um, allegations. Um, and he um, has recently failed to appeal the decision in the Court of Appeal. Uh, but um, he's, he's suffered consequences as a result of pretending to be a lawyer. Um, so how do you manage that client relationship? Well, um, the, the, none of this is rocket science, but we've had to reflect on the way the lessons we learn for lawyers uh, in the cases we investigate to be able to repeat these to you. Apologies are always valuable. Uh, last time I was sharing the stage with um, Alex McMillan from LPLC, she said, excuse me, Mr Commissioner, please don't ask your client, your, your lawyers to apologise because you'll ruin the um, indemnity cover under the, under the policy. I'm not suggesting that you uh, admit or apologise in cases that are um, potentially um, involve a liability action against you. I'm talking about that simple nurturing of the relationship with the client. I promise I'll send that letter next Thursday. Next Thursday, when you have not sent that letter, you need to be the first person to ring the client up and say that you haven't done it. Um, nurture that trust relationship that you are gifted on the first day that a client comes to see you and continue working it like a garden or a, or a good marriage. You, um, uh, the, you in cement the trust of your client when you acknowledge that you are imperfect. They don't expect you to be perfect. Young lawyers, uh, may, maybe even others, try to be superhumans. They uh, believe that um, if they're that good, they must be able to do 10 other areas of law as well. Well, they shouldn't. 
uh, don't stray beyond your strength and your, and your, and your, um, and your training and your experience. Um, be honest, manage the expectations of your client, all obvious straightforward things, but when those things go out of kilter, the relationship breaks down. Again, tips to prevent disputes. Actively communicate with clients about costs. Uh, use various means of communication, phone, text, email, but voice. They've got to hear you, they've got to speak to you. Many complaints are about he, she or he won't tell me what's going on, won't answer my correspondence, won't speak to me. On costs, never assume, never assume that your client understands the costs arrangement. Just like you're buying something in Myers, make sure the costs discussion is upfront, confident and transparent and, and, and that you develop a confident uh, language around the costs discussion. That's all they want to hear about and the mistake you would make is assuming that they understand the cost situation. Actively manage their expectations and whatever you do, keep detailed file notes. I can assure you in dealing with the, the, the uh, sometimes irreconcilable, irreconcilable dispute between a client and a practitioner, the practitioner's notes are very, very handy. Very, very handy. So, you know, when you phoned the client and said that this occurred, make a note about it. It becomes very, very important to you later on when you need to retrace your steps, either for the legal project, but certainly if you're in the unlucky position where you're working with us in relation to a complaint. So I've done my time, Michael, and I'm going to um, pass over to, back to you.